Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Nancy McKinstry, CEO of Walters Kluwer. Nice to see you, Nancy. Nice to meet you, Andy. So a lot of people here in the United States maybe aren't familiar with Walters Kluwer. However, if they were investors, they're probably sorry they hadn't because the stock has been on a great run over the past decade plus. We'll get to that. But first of all, tell us about Walters Kluwer right. and what the business is and what the company does. So Walters Kluwer is an information and uh, software business which serves professional customers. So doctors, lawyers, accountants, financial professionals. The company started um, many, many years ago. It's over 187 years old. So it started as a traditional uh, publisher. In Holland. In the, in Netherlands. the Netherlands. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's where we're traded on that exchange. And over the many years now, we've transformed where 93% of our revenues are digital and more than 50% of our products are expert solutions, which are really very specific kinds of workflow tools that our customer use, uses largely to, to gain productivity benefits and to ensure uh, flawless compliance with rules and regulations. And so that is at the heart of what we do is we have this very expert group of professionals that have deep knowledge in specific areas. And now we put that together with technology and deliver a solution to clients. Right now, you mentioned you're traded in the Netherlands, but there is an ADR yes. traded over the counter here in the United yes. States. We'll, yes. Again, we'll talk yes. a little bit more about that. It's a very profitable company, I noticed. You have a billion dollars in net income on five and a half billion in sales. Um, so what are some of the pieces that are important? I think healthcare is yes. a very important field for you guys. Yes. So health is one of our uh, premier uh, uh, market segments. And the reason for that is we own these very iconic uh, products that are used every single day by nurses and doctors. So the next time you go and visit a physician and you mention the, the product up to date, very likely, uh, they are a customer of ours. You know, it's used by over 2 million physicians around the world. And what they're using this for is to diagnose and treat patients. And so we pride ourselves on being very focused on how do customers actually get their work done. And then we build solutions that help them along that journey. So in the case of health, it's very clinically focused around what's, what does the patient have and then how can we help them uh, formulate the right treatment plan. Right. Information is the new oil, as they say, right? Yes. And AI is something that you guys are keen on, probably have been dabbling in it or using it for before it became cool, as they say, yeah. right? Yeah. So over, this is an interesting uh, fact about the company, over 50% of our digital revenues use some form of AI. So now, of course, everyone's talking about Gen AI, but there's many other different kinds of AI tools. And so we've been doing, uh, working with AI for about 10, 12 years now. And so pre-Gen AI, it was primarily focused on robotic process automation and predictive analytics. Again, really designed to help our customers get to the answers very quickly and then automate their work, you know, which is, as you know, anytime you talk to a, an accountant or a lawyer, they're under a lot of pressure to do more with fewer resources. So that whole focus on productivity, which really emerged about 20 years ago and has only gotten more pronounced for our customers, that is an area where AI just is a perfect solution for many of the problems. And now, of course, Gen AI brings with it a whole nother you know, set of opportunities in terms of what we can do uh, for our clients. Now, Nancy, you were the first American and the first woman right. to run this company. Has that been an advantage or a disadvantage? At the time I took over, which was 2003, the company was struggling. You know, we hadn't invested uh, to really bring our products into the internet world, which was, you know, emerging at that time. And, and the company was losing, you know, growth and, and profitability. So when I came in, I was really a change agent at that moment, and I needed to set with my team kind of this bold agenda around transforming the business. So I think it helped to be sort of, I was an insider in that I knew the business, but I was an outsider in terms of being an American, being a female. And so that was actually turned out in hindsight to be a very strong combination in terms of getting people to recognize we needed to change and set a different course for the business. I mean, was that change kicking and screaming, or did people go along with it? What was that like? 
It was, uh, it was uh, so maybe a little bit in between uh, what you just described. I would say that there was deep recognition on the part of our employees that the, the company needed to pivot, that it wasn't on the right track. But then, of course, it takes a long time to do a transformation, right? It was not an overnight. And so I would say uh, the team did a phenomenal job at keeping people motivated, particularly over the first 10 years as we started to really evolve towards not just digital information, but more and more building these very sophisticated workflow tools. And so that's that's where I would say there was more of needing to kind of really, you know, lean in on the change management element and really uh, help our employees see that the, the journey was worth taking. Right. You mentioned that the bulk of the business is in the United States. Yes. Tell us about the global footprint of the company and how many employees you have, et yes. cetera. So uh, about 65% of our revenues come from the, the from North America uh, and a bit more of our profits. But we operate in about 185 countries around the world, you know, largely in the health business in particular and some of our financial uh, service products. So we have uh, about 22,000 employees and, and then we have what we call our augmented uh, staff teams, largely again, uh, supporting our IT uh, you know, businesses. And, and, and so in totality, if you look at sort of our resource pool, it's closer to sort of 25,000 people. And one of the things we pride ourselves on is that we have a very diverse uh, employee population, not just in terms of gender diversity, but uh, ethnic diversity and nationality diversity. So we operate in all these countries and it's largely run by local nationals. So people that understand the market, speak the language of our customers, and that really has helped us build these very strong, you know, kind of customer franchises around the world. Are, is most of your information in English or do you do different languages? Uh, uh, in health, we, we do primarily English language, and then we can, you can do a search in about 15 other different languages, but the results are largely coming back in English because they, you know, customers talk about the language of medicine as English because people sort of train in that as a profession. In legal and tax, it is more local for local because, of course, it's, it's grounded in the fact that you need to understand the local jurisdiction. Uh, so there it would be in whatever language we're operating in. When I was looking at your company, Nancy, I noticed all these venerable old U.S. names of companies and businesses and pieces of them that you bought, such as Lippincott, John Wiley, Prentice Hall, CCH, yeah. the old commerce clearinghouse where you worked. Right. Do you yeah. still own pieces of those businesses and they're part of the company writ large now? Yes. Most of those we still own. And, and if you go out and talk to customers, uh, you know, they, those are the brands that, that they know and they trust. And if you think about with each technological advance, so if you go back to when the internet first came out, you know, there was a real focus on, you know, would people that had proprietary information like we do survive? You know, that was the, the growth of Google and all of the, the, the primary search engines. And if you look at what has happened since the, the onset of the internet and now with Gen AI, is the value of the content and the value of the brands actually has increased quite dramatically. And the reason for that is that ultimately, our customers need to know that they can trust the fundamental content and, the, and how that's used to make a decision. And so that element of trust is really incorporated into all these brands. And in fact, the oldest product line is Lippincott. Lippincott is over 200 years old. And if the next time you encounter a nurse, ask uh, him or her, you know, do, do they know Lippincott? And they will know that brand because that's how they trained on that brand. So these brands have tremendous equity, but again, it's it goes back to the value is in that trusted, authoritative, you know, kind of content. Oh, I know those names and sort of many Americans. Yeah. I, I want to ask you about your competitive set. Yes. Um, who are your peer companies? You probably compete against different companies in different places, right. but can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So, so because we serve a wide range of different professional types, we serve, we see different competitors in each one of those verticals. So they range all the way from 
you know, a smaller company that might have a one product uh, solution in a particular vertical to very large uh, technology companies. So we will compete with against folks like SAP and Oracle in some of our verticals. And then if you're a shareholder, most of the, the basket that we're in from a shareholder perspective are going to be names like Thomson Reuters, uh, you know, Relics, Pearson, S&P, those kinds of, you know, uh, uh, players in the marketplace. Well, as I mentioned earlier, you stack up pretty favorably versus those companies and certainly the S&P 500. I have numbers going back uh, 10 years, which is, you said, yeah. your tenure is twice as long as yes, that. Yeah. Um, but the stock is up 628%. That's the Dutch equity versus 191% for the S&P 500. The U.S. ADR up 500%. I guess the underperformance versus the Dutch equity is probably because of currency, yes. I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, it's still pretty pretty darn strong. And market cap is about $40 billion. Is there any upside left, I guess I would ask, as a shareholder? I mean, the stock is also a little pricey at 38 times earnings, the P.E. So um, is there room left to go? Yes, we are really excited about the future. I have to say, being in my role uh, over the many years, the company has never been in better shape in terms of you know the fundamental product portfolio and the strength of our customer relationships and the pace of evolution. So you know, really, what's driven a lot of the 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 uh, market value is been around increasing our organic growth. So when I started in the business we didn't have organic growth, it was actually negative. And now we've been delivering with our half year results, 6% organic growth. And as we continue to grow in the areas like expert solution and digital uh, content, those grow even faster. And so uh, we are on a track um, uh, towards, you know, continuous improvement in organic growth. And that of course allows you to expand operating margins. And one of the things that's so rewarding, uh, I think, for me and the team is during that first transformation of going from print to digital, you didn't really increase the profit opportunities by very much, right? You were kind of taking your customers from one media to another. You had to invest a lot to accomplish that. But since we've been on this, you know, second phase of transformation towards expert solutions, what is really exciting about that is these kinds of products are really sticky. They were new at high levels, and therefore, if you look at the margins you can achieve when these products are at scale, it's significantly higher than digital content. And so this next rotation that we've been on is really quite exciting from a sort of what we can do with the business and what that means for shareholders. Is this adjacent to or connected to subscription revenue, essentially? Yes, we're yeah. 83% of our revenue is recurring. So most of what we mm -hmm. do is, whether you call it a software license or or a subscription, it's that, that kind of ret recurring business. And that allows us, you know, one of the things that's so special about the industries that we operate in is that because fundamentally our customers are using these products every day and they have a lot of trust that by using the product they're going to make good decisions, is you have that, that installed base of customers to go back out to. And so as we innovate and we bring new products to market, we have that ready, you know, uh, ready, uh, you know, kind of reception uh, to at least, you know, entertain adding another new product into the portfolio. Sales leads, as it were. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, yeah. My other question besides the stock being, you know, having gone on this run already, and maybe more upside to come, is you personally, you mentioned you've been CEO yes, since yeah. 2003. It's 21 years, a long time to be CEO. Yeah. What are your plans? Do you plan on sticking around for a while? Yeah, no, I still am super excited about what we're doing. Uh, I'm a lifelong learner, so I have this natural curiosity about what's the next uh, phase for the company and, and the industry. So I have no near-term plans. Uh, but with that said, uh, you know, I see part of my role is as, uh, you know, as a steward of the business. The company's been around in, you know, a very long time. And so we take uh, talent development and succession planning very seriously, seriously at all levels. And so, you know, we work hard to make sure that, you know, regardless of whether it's me personally or others in the organization that we have plans and we continue to grow our, our, our team. And, uh, and it, you know, it's great to see, you know, we just formed a new division about two years ago 
and we staff that new division. It focuses on corporate performance and ESG, and we're a market leader in that area. And so what was a sort of a testament to, again, the, the talent um, management focus is that we were able to staff that organization almost all internally. And so that shows that we were sort of, again, you know, um, building these next generation leaders. And finally, Nancy, I want to ask you a little bit about you. Yes. You were raised in Portland, Connecticut. I had to look that up. It's halfway yeah. between yeah. New Haven and Hartford. Right. You went to the University of Rhode Island, go Rams. Yeah. And then you become the CEO of a Dutch business information company. I mean, how did that happen? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, my mother was a, a kindergarten teacher for, for over 30 years. And so she instilled in myself and my siblings, you know, this, this, this sort of focus on education. And so I grew up in a very small town, lived for a while on a dirt road, so very rural, um, didn't have a lot of means, you know, that type of lifestyle. And it was really through education. So I went to the University of Rhode Island and then uh, uh, went to work in the telco industry and then went to Columbia Business School. And I would say that was the pivotal moment because I got an MBA and I started to work actually out of business school in consulting. And this was in the 80s when there was this convergence between telecommunications, technology, and media. And so that was really the start of how I got into the information business was working on those kinds of products. And I would say it was quite an exciting time. And one thing led to another. So, you know, I, I didn't have any kind of master plan. If you had asked me when I was a child what a CEO did, I wouldn't have any clue. And so it was really this, this kind of continuously, you know, to learn what was going on, particularly from the technology side. Fascinating. Nancy McKinstry, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. This is At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll catch you next time.